Most people think of the Civil War as the South versus the North, Union versus Confederate. But we are going to take you behind the scenes during the Civil War in North Carolina to show you how, during wartime, some of us were fighting a different fight, our own fight, a fight for our rights. First, we're going to see what problems Lumbee people were dealing with near Wilmington and how they solved it. During the war, Wilmington was an important port for the Confederacy. The Confederates needed a fort to protect Wilmington, so they built Fort Fisher. The amount of manpower needed to build Fort Fisher was so great, the Confederate Army tried to force the Lumbees into the effort. Their fancy word for it was conscription. Ah, conscription. The Home Guard, a band of local men who were either too old or too young to fight in the Army as soldiers, were in charge of making sure Lumbees did the work. As you can guess, Lumbees did not like being forced to work on the fort for little or no pay at all. Many Lumbees escaped, but a large number were still made unwilling and unpaid workers. Did someone say slavery? It sure sounds like slavery. In 1864, members of the Home Guard arrested and executed one young man's father and brother. The anger of that young man, a Lumbee named Henry Barry Lowry, drove him to fight back. With some friends, family, and other local men who also hated the Home Guard, the Lowry Gang was born, and the Lowry War began. Although the Lowry Gang fought for a Lumbee cause and was led by a Lumbee, not all of the members were Lumbee. There were other races, groups, and tribes in the gang as well. There are still Lumbee in North Carolina today. We were able to interview two of the tribe's leaders at the American Indian Heritage Celebration in Raleigh. Henry Berry and his gang were known as being excellent guerrilla fighters. They could hide out in the swamps, they knew the swamps very well, and so that was their comfort zone. And um, so they had different set hiding places in various communities they could hide out in, and the support of the community. Henry Berry Lowry was like a local Robin Hood. At one point, North Carolina's Governor James Worth put a reward out for Henry Berry Lowry's capture. In the end, no one knows for sure what happened to him, but we do know that he was a great man who fought against discrimination on behalf of the Lumbee tribe so that they could live their lives on their own terms. Before 1861, the journey to freedom for enslaved blacks was long and treacherous. But all of that changed in 1862, when Union forces grabbed portions of the North Carolina coast centered around the city of New Bern. This made freedom that much closer for enslaved people in the South, and they escaped to the city in large numbers. This migration of fugitive slaves to New Bern was the beginning of an unsung civil rights movement in North Carolina, and it came a century before the well-known civil rights movements of the 1950s and 60s. New Bern quickly grew into a thriving city with a huge working, business-owning, elite black population. And it is here, in New Bern, that our research brings us to our second hero. There, the freedmen and fugitive slaves met up with a charismatic spy master, more cunning than any James Bond could ever be. More skills than Chuck Norris. I mean, what? maybe not that skilled, but you get the point. I mean, get this. 6,000 people came to his funeral. That's even more than the entire population of New Bern at the time. This master of espionage organized fugitive slaves and Union forces alike into self-governing communities with his own words. His name was Abraham Galloway, and he was so secretive that only one picture of him exists. We were intrigued by Galloway's stories and wanted to find out more. So, one of our young scholars, Eden, sat down with the historian David Soselsky, who had spent seven years tracking down the history of this elusive character. So, when I was doing research on Abraham Galloway, mm -hmm. I read that he kind of separated himself from the Union soldiers and started to focus more on the um, free people in the South. Sure. The Union's commitment, the North's commitment to African American freedom was far too weak. His work as a Union Army spy sort of moves towards becoming an organizer of the freed people, of the former slaves. 
and gradually part of his work behind enemy lines becomes helping those people kind of pull together and, and make their way to freedom. It was Galloway's masterful use of wit and his willingness to do whatever was necessary for his end goal that opened a huge door for the civil rights of freed men during the Civil War. In fact, he was so influential and successful that later in his life, after the war, he was elected Senator of North Carolina. He used this platform to promote the rights of another group, women. Women's rights. For the people, by the people, just not by the women. Historian's warning. Side effects of women not having any rights may include domestic violence, bread riots, depression, anxiety, child abuse, rape, an incomplete society, narrow viewpoints, murder, decrease in economy, and death. Many women were struggling when their husbands, sons, and fathers went off to war. There were 135,000 households in North Carolina at the time, and 120,000 men from the state were in the army. So almost every household had at least one man serving the army. Life was hard. Moving regiments of soldiers would take anything they came across, including crops, fences, and livestock. Due to speculators, prices had risen much too high and shortages were rampant. In Salisbury, on March 18, 1863, a group of mothers and wives of Confederate soldiers stormed many stores that were Union blocked. Michael Brown, one of the store owners, reported that when he refused to put reasonable prices on his goods, the women attempted to break down his store armed with hatchets. When the men surrendered at Appomattox and Bennett Place at the end of the war, they had to walk back to their homes. These were changed men. Gone was the bravado. They were beaten, exhausted, hungry. They had a hard life ahead and no slave labor available to help them in the rebuilding. Sometimes, rather than come home to face more struggle, Soldiers chose to run off to the West and never see their wives and families again. We wanted to learn more about the experience of women in the Civil War. So we went to talk to our friend Lorraine Umfleet in New Bern. She's an expert on North Carolina's history and a reenactor at the Tryon Palace. When we met with her, she was dressed in period clothing. During the occupation, uh, access to goods and services for New Bern was different than it was in other parts of the state. Now, the problem in that equation is access to money. So there were women, most of the time these were African-American enterprising women. We know two of them, Mary Jane and Sarah Connor. And they were New Bern women. We're not sure if they were enslaved before the war, but we do know what they did when the Union got here, which was to find a house that was vacant. They turned it into a boarding house. They leased rooms out, they cooked for the soldiers, they mended their clothes, and they made an enterprise for themselves. And that's just the perfect example of making lemonade out of lemons. Women were the driving force on the home front and kept both the Union and the Confederacy alive during the war. The last frontier on the home front and the setting for another civil rights struggle was in Western North Carolina. Most people know the story of the 1838 Cherokee Trail of Tears, which forced thousands of Cherokee Native Americans from their homes to Oklahoma on a treacherous walk covering more than 2,000 miles. However, the Eastern Band of Cherokee were able to stay on their land because of the work of William Holland Thomas. We talked to Dr. Ben Fry, who explained how we did this. Dr. Fry, who was William Thomas? So William Holland Thomas was the adopted son of Chief Drowning Bear, or Yonaga Shka. And he was adopted by Chief Drowning Bear when he was maybe 10 or 12 years old. And he lived with the Cherokees, so he was very much a part of the community. And um, it just so happened to be sort of a happy coincidence that he, he, he was white. And so that allowed him to uh, help out the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians in a lot of ways later on in his life. We checked in with Joel Queen, a Cherokee potter, 
who we met at the American Indian Heritage Celebration. We asked him what he knew about Will Thomas and the Eastern Band Cherokee. Will Thomas, he taught us more about the political governments probably more than anybody because he was able to petition the state courts, uh, North Carolina especially, allowing the Eastern Band to stay in the mountains. Um, that's probably the biggest and the greatest thing he done for us was allowing us to stay here instead of going on a removal. The Cherokee's goal was clear. Their main priority was keeping their land. Which side of the war that they fought on didn't matter, so they eagerly enlisted in Thomas's legion to fight for the Confederacy since they thought it would give them leverage in keeping their land after the war. So did we win or lose? Certainly we won many hard-fought battles, but the Civil Rights War still rages on. While there were many successes and braveries to celebrate, this is not a happy story. It shows a brief window of opportunity seized by enterprising people that closed way too early. For African Americans, many of the gains we won during and after the Civil War faced violent, racist counterattacks. Battles against Jim Crow, lynching, segregation, and mass imprisonment followed. We fought then, throughout the 60s, and today. Sometimes the fight is undercover, like housing and educational discrimination. Other times, the battle is bloody, as in the 1898 coup in Wilmington, Selma 50 years ago, and most recently in Ferguson and Baltimore. Women who fought their rights and burst out of their assigned roles could never truly be the same. The running of households and farms, the participation in the war efforts and events like the bread riots were a foundation for change. Only two generations later, the suffragette movement for voting rights began in North Carolina, followed by the larger women's movement in the 60s. The Lumbee never achieved federal tribal status, even though many of them had supported the North. Lumbee still reside in North Carolina in significant numbers. They are a tight, vibrant community. They remember the legacy and the heroes of the Lowry Gang. The Eastern Band of Cherokees fared better. Retaining their land and gaining federal recognition, they lost other rights like voting for a long period. The Eastern Band has recently experienced many economic successes, and they are also making progress in teaching the Cherokee language in their schools. The war for the civil rights you now enjoy has centuries-old origins and includes hard-fought battles. The war is still fought to this day. That's why women are still being paid less. African Americans and Latinos are still being targeted by the police. And Native Americans still face difficulties brought on by centuries of systematic murder and oppression. And we're part of that fight. As the John Hope Franklin Young Scholars, our mission is to inform people about the history they don't learn in school, about all the heroes whose legacies have been silenced. Henry Barry Lowry, Abraham Galloway, Mary Jane and Sarah Connor, the women of Salisbury, William Holland Thomas, and countless people who fought for progress. Inspired by the legacy of the great John Hope Franklin, the Young Scholars in a program based at Duke University for Durham Public School students. Every year we work on a new project to spread information about little known history, so our generation and future generations don't make the same mistakes. There is still work to do, so get started! <laughs>
Ready, set, go. There is still Lumbee in North Carolina to... In, oh my gosh, I can't do this. Annual Native American... Oh, no, no! Like, to interview two of the... Of the well, to interview two of the leaders' tribes. Tribe two. Leaders. <laughs> the <laughs> annual American Indian celebration. Oh no, I messed up. And when we met with her, she. Uh, <laughs> you should have seen how many times Matthew had to do it. Okay. At the Native <laughs> Ameri annual American Heritage Celebration. Oh my <laughs> God. Oh, almost, almost, almost. We got Go this. On. We got this. Okay.